April Bever was a stay-at-home mother of seven children. She frequented Pinterest, Instagram, and Reddit, and would often discuss her lifestyle and children on her social media. One particular comment she made on Reddit gave an interesting glimpse into her life. In January of 2015, she responded to a poster who had asked if being child-free was the best way to live a frugal lifestyle. April said, quote, I have seven children, and we have always lived on one income and have never had any government assistance or needed it. We have a 4,700-square-foot house, two newer cars, and my kids do not do without. There are childless people that do not have this. Life is about making good job or income choices and then making the best money choices based on your income. I would never give up having any of my children so that I could have more money. They are amazing people, and the world will benefit from having them in it. And nothing I could buy or invest in could compare to giving a person a chance to have a life. On Reddit, she also talked about meeting her husband David when he was 26. She said in regards to underage marriage, quote, I was 15 when I got married in Texas in 1987. Parents had to sign a form, was not pregnant. Still married to the same guy and seven kids later. Not letting my daughter, but it worked for us. I lived in Oklahoma at the time. In Oklahoma, I could have if I had been pregnant. She and David lived in Broken Arrow, an affluent suburb near Tulsa that had a population made up of mostly senior citizens. Their children were Robert, Michael, Crystal, Daniel, Christopher, Victoria, and Autumn, and ranged in age from 18 to just shy of two years old. All of the children had been homeschooled and didn't leave the house very much. Autumn had been born prematurely, which inspired April to create a nonprofit called Autumn Hope Incorporated, which aimed to help other premature babies. Local resident Amy Dean had been David's manager for some of his career and was herself involved in homeschooling, serving as the founder of Cornerstone Homeschool Cooperative in Broken Arrow. She had been very involved in the homeschooling community and never saw the Bevers involved in any groups. When the Bever family started to make headlines, multiple homeschool groups came forward to say that they had never had contact with the Bever family. Though many neighbors had spoken with the parents, they didn't really see the children. Hi, I'm your host, Zach Williams. Welcome to Compulsion. Their house was one of the more expensive ones in the subdivision, with nice cars parked in the driveway, but the backyard was overgrown and the playground looked to be rarely used. The children mostly stayed inside. One neighbor recalled walking up to Michael while he was mowing the lawn and trying to make small talk, but Michael was not interested. Another recalled running into one of the older boys as they were taking a walk with their kids. They'd startled him when rounding a corner and he just stared at them as they kept walking. She said the incident had unsettled her. Local resident Helen Hoagland said the kids seemed friendly, but the family was very reserved. She said she had occasionally exchanged pleasantries with Robert, and he would walk the neighbor's dog. She also said that a few years prior, the children had helped her put up Christmas decorations at the entrance to the subdivision. No one in the family had a criminal record, and the police said that they had never been called to the house for any domestic reason. Neighbors described the family as polite but reclusive, and had the impression the children were not allowed outside often. David Bever worked in IT, but wasn't active on social media. Lisa Wolf, David's boss at work, said the following in an Associated Press interview on July 24, 2015. Quote, He was a nice guy, but we weren't close. I hired him. He worked for us for several years as a contractor. He was a good worker and a nice guy. He didn't get involved in any office politics, and those are the kind of people I like to work with. He liked to do his work and focus on that. He didn't socialize a lot with the folks he worked with. The family's isolation would become a topic of great debate later on. Michael Bever, in particular, only had three people in his contacts. His mother, his father, and Robert. 
though he did have a few online friends he emailed with. He also suffered from a speech impediment and possibly untreated dyslexia. Neighbor Matt Jacobson described Michael as having an interest in computers and technology and said he was more a follower than a leader. In an interview with the Tulsa World on July 26th, Matt Jacobson described the boys as nice but quiet and seemed to take after their father and having an affinity for technology. In a quote that would be used in several other newspapers, he described April Bever as, quote, very much a mother hen. He said he could tell the boys were a bit starved for attention and probably wanted to be seen as more normal than they were. The family had never had legal troubles or any issues reported with children's services. Robert Bever, the eldest of the children, was social media savvy as well. He had a YouTube channel where he posted a few vlogs and a comedic skit that the audio has been removed from. His Pinterest showed that he liked Linkin Park, Star Wars, and had an affinity for sports cars. Neighbor Billy Polini said the boys were very sweet, and she remembered Robert walking to Walmart one year to surprise his family with Christmas gifts. The closest Walmart to their block was 2.4 miles away. Robert had briefly worked at a Mica Tech call center, but when reporters asked his former co-workers about him, they all declined initial interviews. Eventually, one of Robert's former co-workers chose to interview with the Tulsa World on July 25th. She said that Robert always walked to work, which was a roughly 20-minute trip. She said he was a bit out there, resented the fact that he had been homeschooled, and wasn't religious like the rest of his family. She said, quote, He was so sure he would have gone to Harvard or Yale had he not been homeschooled. He thought he had so much potential that wasn't being reached. He definitely thought of himself as extremely intelligent. She said he didn't have any other friends, and he didn't want any other friends, as he didn't like people. And she noted that everyone he had added on Facebook was either a relative or an online friend. She said he always spoke fondly of his siblings and would tell stories about Autumn and Michael in particular. Though the family seemed harmless, it had a dark side. David had been abusive towards the children on occasion, particularly Robert and Michael when they were younger. He allegedly threatened Robert's life from a young age. When Robert turned 13, he started to think about what would happen if his parents murdered him. And then he started to think about the reverse as well. What would happen if he murdered them? He would later say in court that, quote, it felt better that way. As they grew up, Robert and Michael began to take an interest in mass murderers and serial killers, as well as the biblical apocalypse. Their parents would often discuss the rapture, and both boys found it interesting. Robert and Michael shared a bedroom, and Michael would often fall asleep listening to Robert talk about mass murder or the apocalypse. Eventually, Robert started describing in detail how he and Michael could kill people, just like all of their heroes. After his 18th birthday, Robert started ordering body armor and knives. His collection was partly inspired by his favorite movie, Rampage. Robert would later say that the only reason he got a job was so that he could save enough money to buy weapons online. Eventually, their talks turned to killing their own family and even beyond that, going on a cross-country murder spree. They planned on killing five people in every destination they stopped at. They were going to pick populated areas like restaurants and malls and planned on using Molotov cocktails to throw at anyone who tried to pursue them. They talked about their plans nightly. Robert had ordered a shotgun and two pistols and was set to pick them up the day after the slayings. Robert and Michael eventually settled on a plan. They would start by killing their family, dismembering their bodies, and storing them in bins in the attic. Then they would take off armed with a plethora of ammunition, and start a cross-country killing spree in the family car. They were planning on lining up the bodies and making a video in front of them. Detective Eric Bentz said in a later interview of the planned videos that, quote, Robert wanted to make a video with him in the living room with the bodies visible, which would be seen by attorneys and law enforcement. He also wanted to make a second video that he said was less, quote, horrific, so it would go public. He called it a G-rated video. On July 22, 2015, Robert realized that some of the ammunition he'd ordered was being shipped to his house. 
They had ordered 2,000 rounds of 45 caliber ammunition and 250 shotgun shells. They weren't planning on killing their family that night, but decided to move the timeline up so that their family wouldn't realize what they had planned. That morning, Robert wrote in his journal, quote, We're going to kill them tonight. Robert had plans to decapitate Autumn with an axe, so Michael wanted to spend the day with her to say goodbye. He spent all day holding her, but didn't say anything to Robert about derailing their plans. Crystal went into the brothers' room just around 11.30 p.m. to tell them that April wanted them to do the dishes. The boys were trying on body armor, which she'd seen them wearing before and didn't think too much of it. One of them asked the other, quote, should we do it now? To which she responded, well, I'm here now. What do you want? Michael showed her something on the computer screen, and while she was distracted, Robert snuck up behind her. Robert was wearing black gloves, and when Crystal was looking at the screen, he grabbed her and attempted to slit her throat. She said it took her a minute to realize what was happening. Quote, it just felt like metally, like I could taste it. Robert would later say, quote, from the moment Crystal didn't drop dead from being stabbed in the throat, it was just chaos. One account says April walked upstairs to see what the screaming was about, saw Crystal, and started yelling for someone to call the police. Then Robert stabbed her as well. Robert stabbed Crystal multiple times, but Crystal fought him off and ran out of the room. She was originally going to head to her room to use the phone, but quickly decided to run for the front door. She heard her mother screaming to call 911, and during her escape realized one of her organs was coming out of her stomach. She then ran into Victoria and told her to lock herself in the bathroom. She later said Victoria would probably open the door if Robert told her to, though, because, quote, she trusted him very much. Crystal tried to run to a neighbor's house for help, but collapsed shortly after getting out of the front door. On her way out of the door, Crystal triggered the home security alarm, but Michael quickly turned it off. She could hear Daniel screaming and realized that Robert and Michael were trying to kill everyone. In a later confession, Michael said he found her and strangled her, until Robert told him that she had stopped breathing. Michael remarked that, quote, he hated to have to do this in front of the neighbors. Then he dragged her back inside, and Robert went to go kill David. In her account, Crystal says she is not sure who dragged her back into the house. But at one point, while Robert was attacking her, she could hear April and Daniel screaming. When Michael finished dragging Crystal back inside, David was running down the stairs. He tried to fight Robert and asked him, quote, Why are you doing this? To which Robert responded, quote, Because I must. Robert stabbed David in the chest several times. After David died, Robert pointed a knife at Michael and told him to show him where the children were. Michael knocked on the bathroom door where Christopher and Victoria were hiding and said, quote, let me in. He's going to kill me. Robert would later remark, wow, I didn't even think of that. One of the children opened the door and Michael kicked it down. Their testimonies differ, but either Robert alone or both of the boys then stabbed their siblings. Daniel had hid in his father's office and used the phone in there to call 911. He told the operator that his brother was attacking his family. Michael knocked on the door while he was on the phone, telling him that Robert was looking for him. Daniel opened the door and Michael stepped aside to reveal Robert and said, He's all yours. Daniel said, don't kill me, I love you. Then one of the older boys picked up the phone and said, hello, and hung up. Seven minutes later, the police would arrive. After they killed Daniel, Robert started heading out towards the garage, but Michael told him that they could get spotted that way and ran for the back door instead, passing Crystal along the way and realizing that she was still alive. As they ran into the woods, Michael threw part of his body armor off to try to create a fake trail. They hid in a ravine in the woods behind their house, just about 300 yards away. While they were hiding together, Robert told Michael, quote, six out of seven isn't bad. To which Michael responded that Crystal was still alive, but had all this stuff hanging out of her. Then Michael became physically ill. 
When police arrived, the front porch had blood on it. They knocked on the door and heard someone calling for help inside. They asked Crystal to open the door, and when she told them she couldn't, they kicked it down. Crystal was still conscious and told them that her brothers were behind the attack. She would later specify that it was Robert. Within three minutes of arriving, the first officer on the scene called for an ambulance twice. April was still alive when the police got into the house, but died before the paramedics could get to her. When the ambulance received the call, Jared Moore warned his new partner that it was going to be a bad call. They arrived just as Crystal was being dragged out of the house, and Moore would later say, quote, I thought she was in the final moments of life. Rather than try to stabilize her there, they got her in the ambulance and headed for the hospital, knowing that time was of the essence. The police had dragged two other bodies out in case there was any chance they could be revived. They found the brothers in a wooded area behind the house. It was initially reported that officers had seen the brothers flee when they arrived, but later reports pointed towards the officers finding fresh footprints leading towards the woods from the back door. It took just four minutes for the dog to find them. Officer Mark Baldwin told the brothers to remain still, but said Michael, quote, appeared to shift his hip in a manner that might be getting up to run or to get something he was lying on. So he told his canine officer to engage. The dog ripped off his vest and bit his shoulder before the officer took both brothers into custody. Baldwin noticed a knife lying on the ground after the brothers got up but wasn't sure who it belonged to. Meanwhile, Jared Moore, the paramedic who was responsible for taking Christopher and Victoria's bodies out of the house, said, quote, It was definitely not an easy thing to see. I relied on my faith, said a prayer to God, and went in and did what we had to do. He said Robert smirked at him as he entered the house. When Michael was arrested, he told his arresting officer, Sergeant Brandon Tenner, I hope they're okay. To which Tenner asked, You hope who is okay? Michael said, The people in the house. And when Tenner asked Bever, What house? He said, Mine. Michael told Tenner that the police had done a good job and, quote, We didn't expect you to get here this fast. Tenner said the house was the bloodiest crime scene he'd ever been in. Both boys were covered in blood, though for Michael, it was mostly his own. Karen Weichel took DNA evidence and swabs from all of the blood spatter on them separately. She said that Michael claimed he didn't kill anyone and had tried to stop his older brother. Weichel did not ask any questions, as she was just there to collect forensics, and Bever hadn't yet been read his rights. She said Michael had blood on his hands, while Robert had blood on his face as well. Autumn was sleeping in her crib upstairs during this entire ordeal. Apparently, Robert forgot about her or didn't have time to kill her. The officer who found Autumn handed her to Trevor Morgan, a paramedic who walked her away from the crime scene. He said she didn't appear to have any injuries. Quote, she was just very frightened. She didn't understand what was going on. He kept an eye on Autumn while police started processing the scene, showing her Sesame Street on his phone and making her a balloon animal out of one of his latex gloves. After that, she wouldn't let any of the other paramedics hold her. Later in the hospital, Crystal, unable to speak due to her injuries, wrote a note to her nurse, Jill Sledge, that said, quote, Two brothers did this to me. When Crystal asked about her parents, the nurse lied and said she wasn't sure, but told her Autumn was safe. The nurse said, quote, I did not want to further her emotional stress. In the days that followed, Children's services workers called numerous extended family members to come and visit Crystal in the hospital, but all of them refused. Jill Sledge said, quote, No grandparents, no relatives of any kind showed up. There was nobody. Meanwhile, Michael was at the hospital being treated for his dog bite. He told his doctor, Wes Wilson, that he'd gotten the bite while running from the police. The doctor asked him questions while Detective Chain Cothran listened in. Bever told him that he'd, quote, got a little crazy and gone along with Robert's plan to kill their family. He said he looked up to mass killers and had aspirations about doing mass murderers, but didn't think Robert would actually go through with it. He said, quote, I was there at the same time. I had to pretend so he wouldn't turn on me. 
Though he largely blamed the killings on Robert, he did admit to the doctor that he had, quote, stabbed somebody, and two knives were found on his person when he was arrested. When both boys were taken to the police station, Robert was smirking in his mugshot, while Michael had a more neutral expression. Detective Rihanna Russell said Michael seemed somewhat sad and had become physically ill when he described killing his family. Michael did tell her of their plans for a murder spree, however. He said the plans were on a USB drive in the house. He told her they had aspirations of outdoing the Aurora movie theater shooting and even Columbine. She told the media later that, quote, they wanted to kill at least 50 people. They wanted to be famous. They wanted a Wikipedia page. They wanted media coverage. Michael's public defense attorney, Corbin Brewster, would later say that the degree of isolation the family lived in meant that Michael's first extended conversation with an adult outside the family was when he was being interrogated by the police that morning. Detective Eric Bentz said Robert did not view killing as a bad thing and was laughing when he described their plans. Bentz said Robert, quote, appeared calm and relaxed and mildly excited when he told of murdering his family. He said Robert lamented the fact that, quote, everyone didn't die like they were supposed to. He described in great detail their plans, and Robert later said, quote, we looked at many, many murders. He said, quote, killing people would be like a hobby, and they wanted to see America as they traveled on their murder spree. He said they, quote, would be like murder superstars. Bentz also reported Robert having delusions, saying, quote, If he killed one person, he was one person. That evened it out. If he killed one more than one person, that would make him like a god. Robert would later be treated for schizophrenia while in prison. Meanwhile, police were processing the scene at the Bever family home. They found a hatchet, knives, darts, and a surgical knife in the house. They also found body armor with sleeves made of Kevlar and a balaclava mask. They took over 100 photos of the crime scene. The autopsy reports later released on October 12, 2015, described the extent of the injuries that needed to be documented. April Bever was stabbed 48 times, 18 of which were on her head and neck. David Bever was stabbed 28 times most of the wounds being on the torso. They had blunt force trauma injuries as well. The children, 5-year-old Victoria, 10-year-old Christopher, and 12-year-old Daniel, all died from multiple stab wounds. In total, the family suffered over 100 stab wounds. In addition to what was found in regards to the murders, police also found machetes, swords, an atlas, wireless cameras, surveillance cameras, and additional knives. The surveillance cameras were actually pointing at the bodies when they were found. Whether the cameras had been set up recently or were already in place as part of the family home is unclear. But in neither statement did either boy mention having time to set up the cameras that night, and they are usually described as already established surveillance cameras within the home. Crystal also did not mention anything about her brothers setting up cameras in the family living space that night. In order to not disturb the crime scene further, the bodies that had already been dragged outside were left out there, but covered with sheets. And as the sun started rising, they were blocked from view of the neighbors with black tarps. But the large pool of blood on the front porch was still visible. The immediate investigation of the scene continued into the next day with neighbors watching as police officers documented everything. They wore plastic coverings over their shoes to try and avoid disturbing the blood spatter. Investigators spent 17 hours that first day investigating the scene. The media spoke with neighbors and curious onlookers to get statements from them the next day. Patricia Statham told the Associated Press, quote, It certainly is shocking. I'm shocked. I feel so bad for everyone who walks into that house. You can see it in the faces of the officers when they come out. Bill Whitworth, a local resident who had a teenage son, said, quote, My son never had an opportunity to play with him because their parents won't allow them to play with the other kids. His son had made attempts to get Robert to go bike riding with him, 
but the unwritten rule of the family was that the kids didn't socialize with the outside world. Police Corporal Leon Calhoun told the Associated Press, quote, I've been here 19 years, and I don't know if we've ever had more than three homicides in a year. This is the worst single criminal event in Broken Arrow history. When asked about possible motives, he said police were still trying to figure something out. But, quote, anytime someone murders their family members as young as five, I don't see how there could be a mental process for that. On July 24th, the Tulsa World reported that Crystal was out of surgery and in serious but stable condition. Crystal and Autumn were placed in the care of the Department of Human Services. A police officer was always posted beside Crystal's bed during her recovery so she wouldn't wake up alone. That same day, the Tulsa World picked up where the Associated Press had left off in getting statements from neighbors. Neighbor Julie Wallace told them, quote, I never expected to see anything like this. I slept through it. My guard dog slept through it. It's just scary. She also mentioned that she had taken in the family dog for safekeeping, in case the girls wanted her back at some point. July 25th, on NBC4, the authorities confirmed that the phone call had been made by Daniel and not Crystal, as initially reported. Of the phone call, Calhoun said, quote, he did save the life of his 13-year-old sister and his 2-year-old sister and possibly many others after that. That same day, the story hit mainstream news. Attorney Steve Kuntzweiler told the media that the 16-year-old would be tried as an adult, but didn't give his name. However, the Tulsa World ran an article simultaneously that leaked Michael's name after a jailhouse employee gave it to them. Police informed the media that there had been plans for an additional murder spree, but didn't elaborate. Calhoun spoke with the media once again, emphasizing how unusual the crime was. He said the local officers normally only worked on one or two homicide cases a year, and this was by far the most gruesome scene they had ever had to work. Quote, most of the detectives are parents, and seeing the bodies of a 5-year-old, a 7-year-old, and a 12-year-old, they're seeing the brutality and gruesomeness of the crime scene. If it doesn't take an emotional toll on you, you aren't human. The media asked Sergeant Thomas Cooper Moore if there were any developments as far as finding out the motive. He told them, quote, I wish there was an easy answer to say, hey, this is why this happened for the public to help understand the horrific crime. But at the end of the day, we don't have that information. With interviews and the crime scene and the detectives doing their work, it's going to take some time to actually tabulate and figure out how it all transpired and say, quote, hey, this may be their motive. A few days later, Calhoun agreed with the media when reporters asked him if he thought Robert Bever was intentionally smirking in his mugshot. He said of Robert's confession, quote, I don't know if there is any remorse or anything going on at this point. I just don't know how, if he's even comprehending what has happened, or if he is really, is so removed that he can't feel remorse. It's unknown. On July 30th, local residents held a memorial for the family. All of the Bevers' extended family was out of state, so people in the neighborhood wanted to do something to show Autumn and Crystal that they cared. About 60 locals gathered outside the Bever family home to hold a candlelight vigil. They left flowers, stuffed animals, and homemade wreaths, hoping to show the surviving girls that the neighborhood was thinking about them and praying for them. On July 31, 2015, both Bever brothers were charged with five counts of first-degree murder and one count of assault and battery with intent to kill. The media reported that Michael would likely be tried as an adult. Oklahoma law says that those above the age of 15 charged with first-degree murder are not subject to the Youthful Offender Act. Roper v. Simmons in 2005 ruled that children being tried as adults could not be sentenced to death. On August 3rd, both brothers appeared in a video hearing that lasted less than five minutes. Michael Bever was going to face charges as an adult. Both attorneys, Cheryl Ramsey and Rob Nye, had filed a motion to suppress certain evidence from the media, 
including certain statements made by the brothers before the trial began, as well as keeping certain evidence out of the public eye. This was done in an effort to avoid a, quote, trial by newspaper, in which it's impossible to find a jury that doesn't already know a great deal about the case. August 5th brought about a debate about the release of the phone call made by Daniel Bever. The media wanted the phone call to be public, but the legal representation of Robert and Michael Bever argued it could mess up their shot at a fair trial. Crystal's attorney also fought to keep the phone call, which was described as gruesome, from being released because it could cause her distress. It was the only time both legal sides banded together. Releasing the gruesome phone call would not help anyone. After a debate that lasted hours, District Judge William Musselman ruled that a transcript of the phone call could be released, but the audio itself would not be. When the transcript was released, the log notes say there was, quote, a lot of screaming in the background, and I could hear someone trying to be quiet and crying. Then a male voice spoke, hello, before the line went dead. The dispatcher called back, and someone picked up but didn't answer. They tried calling again, but it went straight to voicemail. On August 6, 2015, an official memorial service was held for the Bever family. Media liaison Lisa Ford said, quote, It feels like it didn't just happen to this one family. It happened to the whole community. Around 200 people attended the memorial service. The congregation stood and cheered for the first responders who were at the crime scene. The Tulsa World covered the service in detail, interviewing locals and writing down quotes from those who spoke at the service. At the service, police chaplain Scott Keel said, quote, Our community is in shock. For many of us, we can barely wrap our heads around this event. He also said in a statement directed to the survivors, quote, Girls, we love you. We want the best for you, and our hearts hurt for you. We will be strong with you. First responders, we love you, we thank you, and our hearts are heavy for you. We will be strong with you. The crowd prayed for Crystal and Autumn and sang songs together. They focused on moving forward and trying not to dwell on the tragedy. Indian Springs Baptist Church, Pastor Scott Morey, said, quote, We need one another. We need to encourage one another, and we need to pray for one another. That is why we are here tonight. Local pastors talked about healing and moving on, while city officials assured everyone that the tragedy would not define their city. Mayor Craig Thurman said, quote, This will not define our community. When bad things happen, we cannot let that define us in a negative way. We can let that define us in a positive way, and how we recover, and how we go on. Despite these words, over the past five years, the tragedy has come to be known as the Broken Arrow Killings. Music is provided by Hex System. Tulsa World provided a majority of our sources for this episode and provided very accurate and thorough coverage on this case. For a full list of our sources or links to our contributors, please see our show notes. Follow us on Twitter or Instagram at CompulsionCast to stay up to date on our latest episodes and news. See you next week.